So before we start today, this uh, I believe is the last lecture before the project one deadline. Um, are there any uh, questions I can answer before I get started? So show, yeah. Uh, was that in the demo video? It was. Um, I need to re-record that video. Um, so the visitor pattern is uh, potentially a useful tool. Um, I've since making since recording that video about three years ago. Um, to some some years ago, I've. Uh, come to realize that it is easier to just use instance of in uh, like sequences of inst uh, if instance of and, and that's what the slides have been recommending. Uh, does that address your concern? Okay. Uh, yeah. Print. Yeah. Uh, standard output is going to get captured. Um, for reference, uh, since I think frighteningly few of you have already tried, uh, a frighteningly small amount of you have actually tried submitting anything yet, um, er standard error will also be uh, captured but will not actually be graded. So if you use system.error.println, um, that's a way of getting information to you out of the system without actually uh, having that graded. Um, any other questions? All right. Um, I will be holding an extra round of office hours tomorrow. Uh, details will be posted on uh, Piazza and uh, possibly on Monday as well. We'll see how things are going. Uh, all right, so let's actually get to uh, today's topic. So we've been talking at, up till now uh, mostly about doing things in memory. Um, a couple of the algorithms that we've discussed go out to disk. Um, in particular, the external hash join um, is, is a notable example of what you can do when you don't have enough memory. Uh, but in general, uh, a database has uh, a database. A typical database has to work with huge amounts of data, and in practice, there's no way that you're going to get all of that data uh, into memory on one machine. So uh, we have to come up with ways around that. We have to come up with ways to adapt uh, to limited memory settings and to. Um, essentially design an algorithm that, takes into, that can take into account the fact uh, that certain types of data access are going to be way slower than other types of data access. So before I get into, a, into that, let's do a quick recap. Um, there's a bunch of operators. Projection. How much memory do I need to implement projection? How many tuples do I need to store? One. Okay. So projection, easy case. I don't actually need any significant memory to implement projection. How about selection? None or one as well. Um, same thing. I don't actually need a huge amount of memory for selection. Bag union? Two. One or two, yeah. Uh, you need, but either way, it's constant. Um, and that's, uh, in, in general, we're not necessarily interested in the exact amounts at this point. Uh, what we're more interested in is how it scales, what it scales with. Um, so how many, uh, so if it, uh, two or, or three or four, it's all the same as long as it's four regardless of how big your data is. Oh, whoops, sorry. Uh, 
Okay. Um, so, uh, someone who can uh, who uh, has quick eyes, uh, how much memory do I need for join? Yeah. All right, you got quick eyes. What? It, uh, why um, is that always the case? So you have to ma uh, match up every tuple that uh, matches the selection condition. Um, so we talked about a couple of different. Uh, Algorithms, do they all require the same amount of memory? No. Uh, so some join algorithms require a uh, constant amount of memory, and some require uh, an amount that scales in the size of the two data sets. Um, which algorithm we use is entirely, uh, can have some pretty drastic impacts on the, the size of the join. What about the group by operator? How, many, how much memory do we need to implement group by? Uh, can you speak up? Uh, can you? Oh. Uh, how much memory do we need for a group by operator? Hmm? Sure. Uh, so we're going to have to store uh, statistics or aggregate values uh, for every single group that we've encountered so far. So the number of groups. Uh, distinct operator. So how can we implement a distinct operator? Yeah, so you need one for every single distinct value. Uh, so you can either phrase this as the number of distinct values, or uh, in general, a safer assumption needs to be, uh, for distinct, the number of rows in the data set, um, because you may be dealing uh, with not all that many duplicates. Um, and then sort. How much memory do we need to sort a bunch of records? Pick a sort algorithm. How much memory does it use? Hmm? Oh, ben. Yeah, so I need to, uh, if I'm implementing a sort algorithm, I need everything in memory. At least in, um, at least if I'm doing an in-memory sort. So some of these algorithms are very nice. Project, select, bag, union. Those I don't really need to wor uh, worry about. Join, maybe I don't necessarily need to worry about it too much. Uh, group, distinct, at least based on what we've discussed so far. There we might have a little bit of a problem. And sort, well, sort we certainly have uh, a bit of a problem. But the... Uh, one of the dirty secrets of databases is that you actually don't need interesting algorithms for pre, uh, interesting on disk algorith algorithms for nearly any um, for most of these. Uh, in fact, if you have a good on disk sort operator, then you can get away with uh, doing pretty much all of the other operators in constant time. And we'll talk about a little bit about how that works um, later on. Uh, but the first thing I want to start with is this idea of um, being able to sort things in a way that takes account of the fact that you have, uh, that you can access uh, different um, parts of your data set at different speeds. Uh, in other words, that uh, takes account of the fact that uh, you only have a certain amount of memory uh, and the time it takes to access that memory is going to be a lot faster than the time it takes to access disk. So the basic idea behind this algorithm is to divide and conquer. You take your, uh, your data set and you break it up into chunks. So for each of these, these chunks, we're going to uh, first load the chunk off of disk. We're going to sort that chunk. So now we have uh, how um, I'm describing this in terms of pages doesn't have to be precisely one page, but 
we can um, take that chunk of memory, we can sort it, and once it's sorted, we push it back to disk. Um, now, this whole process takes exactly one page of memory. Again, if uh, you want to use bigger chunks and take more memory, but you can pick how big these chunks are. Now, you have a sequence of, uh, of smaller chunks of memory uh, on disk. Excuse me, you have a, a, sequence, a series of these, these chunks of, of sorted data. Uh, what can you do with that next? I mean, that's so far we, we've been kind of limiting ourselves to how much memory we've, we've used. Um, can we do, how can we actually use these, these chunks? Any thoughts? Uh, okay, so let's say that I have two, uh, two sorted arrays, and I'd like to combine them together, merge them into one sorted array. How much memory am I going to need to do that? Yeah. Constant memory. So anytime I'm merging two arrays together, all I really need uh, to, uh, excuse me, all I really need to look at is the first item in each array. Look at the two. And um, as I read from them, I can merge the two uh, together only ever having to look at, uh, at the first couple of elements. And the nice thing, of, well, this takes constant memory. So, so I do two, uh, I, I read in two buffers. If I merge sort them into one buffer that's twice as big, I only ever need to be looking at one page uh, of memory from each buffer at any given point in time. So again, I'm still using constant memory, but now I've uh, essentially taken my, uh, my uh, two buffers and turned them into one uh, somewhat bigger buffer. Um, so, so now that I've, I've merged two pages together, I have a bigger, uh, a, a bigger buffer. I can repeat this uh, however many times I need for the, uh, oh, actually let me, let me ask you, how much, um, how many Let's say I have uh, n sorted buffers. How many times would I have to repeat this whole process uh, in order to get uh, one big sorted buffer? Yes. 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 So let's uh, let's actually see an example of this. So I've got a bunch of uh, data buffers here. I have to do it n times, but yeah, sorry. Um, so I've got a bunch of data buffers here. And I'd like to take all of these uh, buffers and generate one big sorted list. Now, the math works out a little bit uh, more nicely if you have a power of two. So I have this little black box here um, that would represent an empty page. So the first step uh, is pretty much look at each page individually. Take every single page um, and make sure that the, the contents of that page are sorted locally. Then iteratively, um, I can take these pages and merge them together. And in order to do that, I only ever need to look at the first element of each page. Um, so for, for this, I'll need at most four buffers, uh, four pages worth of, of memory. And I can repeat the process over and over again. Um, 
And so as I'm generating these, these, um, these sequences of size four, I only ever actually need to look at uh, the first page of each of the inputs. So simple example here, uh, if I need to, uh, as I'm generating the guy on the left hand side here, I only need to look at uh, two and four to know that the first element is going to be two. I only need to look at three and four to know that the first element is going to be three. Um, then I'm completely done with that first page. I can throw it away. Um, then I only need to look at four and four to know that the next two elements are going to be four. Uh, so then six and seven, I can uh, figure out that six is first, seven is next, and I keep going uh, until I've exhausted everything. So this is basically merge sort. But the uh, nice thing about merge sort is that it doesn't require a huge amount of memory, and it makes it a lot uh, more efficient for putting things on disk. So okay, um, questions so far? Uh, I've described it iteratively, but uh, it could potentially be implemented recursively. Um, oh, take the entire thing and generate. <coughs> okay, so what I've described so far um, targets. Uh, what I've just uh, described so far targets one page. Now, I already mentioned that you can take, uh, when you're generating your initial sorted runs, you can sort larger buffers and get more uh, bigger initial runs. What about in the subsequent stages? How could I take advantage of uh, having more memory uh, for the second pass and, and subsequent passes? Sure. So, uh, okay. So, in in the first pass of uh, this algorithm, we're uh, we're sorting one page at, at a time. But we could potentially do much better if we sorted multiple pages, uh, and that would allow us to take advantage of having more memory available. Um, What about uh, what about in the second and third and fourth and fifth phases? Uh, could we take advantage of having more memory um, at this stage? Yeah. Reading from three buffers instead of two. All right. So what if I had three different input buffers. It might uh, help me because now I've, I've loaded in multiple things. I can actually uh, reduce the amount of uh, the total number of iterations, uh, the, the total number of merge steps that I need to undertake. Uh, where are we? So, in general, how many, um, so that's going to reduce, um, reduce the number of iterations that we need to perform, but it's also, also going to increase the amount of computation that we need to do per iteration. So another possible way to look at this is how many times are we reading in the full data set? How many times are we reading everything in and then flushing it back to disk? 
So in uh, the first step, how many times uh, do we need to read the entire data set in and put it back on disk? Just once. What about the second step, the second iteration? So, ah, uh, what am I doing? So in the second iteration, we're, I mean, we're still reading uh, stuff, of, stuff off of disk. Now we're reading in sorted order, but we're still reading everything back off of disk. So how many times are we reading the entire data set off of disk here? Depends on the size of the uh, page. Um, let's take a look at the big example here. So the more pages there are, the less you're going to read. Is that true? Uh, so per, per one merge step, you mean? OK, what about across the entire iteration? So uh, one whole phase of? Uh, if it's one giant block, you don't have to scan the entire thing. But as you chop up the block into smaller, smaller pieces. So it's going the other way around. You're, yeah. not chop, uh, you're merging, rather. Or you're merging. Yeah, yeah. Merging smaller and smaller pieces together. Um, okay, so uh, let's. So we've got that first step with uh, combining three and four with two and six. Uh, how many uh, pages do we read there? They're only reading two. We're only reading two, and we're writing. Yeah. But how many in total? How many? Uh, how many? Uh, merge, uh, how many times do we merge two, uh, into, uh, two pages together? Twice? Uh, you have to go through all the pages. You, you merge it once, and then you merge it once with the other ones as well. Uh, let's take those, uh, so what do you, uh, what do you mean by twice? Okay, so to get uh, 2, 3, 4, 6, uh, 4, 7, 8, 9, 1, 3, 5, 6, and empty in 2, you'd have to uh, read everything in once, put it back to disk, read everything back in, put it back to disk a second time. All right, what about the third one? So to get 2, 3, 4, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then separately empty 1, 2, 3, 5, 6. Because if, if, if you had like a page of 3, 4, 6, sorted it, you would have to go through, you have to read all four, but the next step, since you halved it each time, well, since there are blocks of two halves, it's only tw you only need to iterate it twice. Okay, yeah. to get the two, three, four, six, yeah, the four, yeah. yeah, so I've gone through two iterations to sort each page individually and then merge, uh, merge uh, into, uh, pages into runs of size two. So it's looking like it's a log of base, whatever size those pages are. Okay, so the the amount of the total um, the total number of phases that we go through is logarithmic in the number of, in, in the size of the data. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, it's logarithmic, and it it's starting to look a lot like we need to read in. For every single phase, we need to read in the entire data set and write it back out again. So ultimately, the bottleneck in this algorithm is that I.O. It's not the computation of merging things together, but it's typically going to be actually reading everything in and then writing it back out uh, to, to disk. So um, if we're doing two full rounds of I.O. for every single uh, iteration, it makes total sense to see if we can reduce the number of iterations without increasing the number, of, the amount of I/O. So, using more memory uh, can buy us a couple of different things. So, in the first phase, what do we get? Uh, how much of a reduction in in cost do we get by using more memory? So, let's say I have enough memory to keep two pages in memory at once.
So let's say I have one page that has three, four, six, and two, or sorry, I can load three, four, six, and two into memory at once, then uh, sort that flush it to disk, nine, four, eight, seven, sort that flush it to disk, uh, five, six, three, one, sort that flush it to disk, and then two is kind of the strike. Yeah? In that case, you should be able to get the All right, so every time you double the amount of memory that you have available, you essentially skip one full iteration of of this process. Good. So what about in the second step? Uh, what do we have? Let's say we merge three things together. Uh, what is that bias? So let's say I, were, I was able to merge three, four, two, six, uh, and four, nine together uh, in memory at once. Okay, so I'm reducing the, the number of iterations I need to, to perform. Can you uh, quantify that? Like, uh, so um, there's a, a term that you might hear come up uh, called fan out. And this is a, a, um, a property of a tree that describes how many branches, uh, how many children each node has. Um, now, my mnemonic for, uh, for properties involving trees, or my mnemonic for uh, time complexity and, and other things involving trees is where there's a tree, there's a log, right? So, okay, they, no, that, that was forced, no, it doesn't count. Um, all right, uh, so the other mnemonic is that the base of the log Really mnemonic, but the, the base of the log is related to the fanout. So here, the fanout is two. Every, uh, every time I merge, I merge two things together. So when I do a log, uh, when I count the number of iterations, it's going to be logarithmic, but it's going to be logarithmic base two. So if I do uh, merge three things together, it becomes logarithmic base three. If I merge four things together, logarithmic base four. And the higher the base, uh, the fewer iterations you have. But the n nifty thing is that by increasing the number of merges uh, of, of um, streams that you merge together, or the number of runs, excuse me, that you merge together, uh, you're not actually increasing the amount of I.O. that you need to do for that particular iteration. If I'm merging three things together, I still have to read all of the records in exactly once and I still have to write them all out exactly once. But now I've uh, reduced the total number of iterations that I have to uh, perform, so I've reduced the total amount of I.O. that I need to do. Okay. Um, any questions so far? Um, so we have to do two full rounds of I.O. Okay, so there's one other optimization that I will describe uh, to this, this basic algorithm. And this one's actually kind of uh, kind of cute because while it's not, um, well, it really shouldn't work, it actually does. Um, so at this point, we're basically doing as good as we can on the second phase and, and all of the subsequent phases. The one phase here that's really, really memory limited, however, is that first phase. Um, because here we're, we are basically loading a whole bunch of stuff into memory and trying to do, uh, trying to do uh, some organization on now, this optimization, which is really kind of clever, um, so the idea is that you might only have some amount of memory, but 
what this optimization does is it allows us to actually produce more sorted data than we actually have memory. Do that. Um, so let me show you this by example. You're going to have three components here. You're going to have an input buffer, so whatever you're currently reading off of disk. Um, you're going to have a working set that represents all of the data that you've looked at so far, and this is going to stay const, uh, constant size. Um, and then we're going to have an output buffer that's going to keep track of all of the, the data that we're currently uh, producing. In this output buffer, every time the output buffer fills up, we're going to flush it to disk, get rid of it, um, and every time the input buffer runs out of records, we're going to bring a new page in. So those two, the input buffer and the output buffer, all stay uh, fixed size. Now we're also going to tra uh, keep track of the last, uh, the last uh, in other words, the highest value that we've currently put into the output buffer. So the idea is basically this working set, this represents all of the records that we have um, knowledge of. So we're going to basically take an optimistic approach. We're going to put uh, whichever the best possible choice uh, is, uh, we're going to take the, the best possible choice, we're going to append it to the output buffer. So for the working set that you see here, what is the, uh, you know, what, uh, so first off, can we append a 2? No, why not? Uh, 2 is less than 3. It's also less than 5. And if we're keeping track of this last element, we actually know that we can't, uh, that 2 is, is, uh, is going to be out of order. So 2 is straight out. What about 10? Are we allowed to append 10? Yes. yes. Do we want to? No, because we can actually do better. If we put that 8 on there, that's, uh, we can put at least in principle, later on we can put uh, the 10 afterwards. Uh, if we put the 10 in first, then it's going to, uh, we lose the ability to add the 8. So we're going to start by uh, finding the lowest value in, a, in our working set that's uh, bigger than k, or equal to k. We're going to append that, and we're going to now keep track of the fact that we've just appended a uh, slightly bigger value. Yeah. Ah, okay. So the, the input buffer is unsorted, but the working set uh, you're going to keep in sorted order. And in fact, now we've, uh, we've just added something to the output buffer. The working set is now uh, has one fewer element, so we're going to basically take one record out of the input buffer and put it sorted into our working set. So let's say we uh, find a 12 in the input buffer. Uh, we're going to put it into that list and then resort the input buffer so that it's in the right place. Um, and we're going to repeat this process. Uh, we're going to keep doing this over and over again um, until uh, we reach the uh, until we reach the end of the working set. Uh, at that point, we have uh, we no longer have the ability to uh, add new things to the output buffer. So we finish the the sorted run. Um, flush that output buffer to disk, and we start a new run from that point uh, with the first element of the working set. Yeah? So we flush in two cases where either the output buffer is full or we flush into the working set? Exactly. So uh, as soon as we reach the end of the working set, then we're done. Basically, we've, we've sorted as many, as much as we can with the memory that we have currently available. Can we go on that? Well, the memory requirements doesn't uh, don't actually change. The input buffer is fixed. The working set size is fixed. The output buffer is fixed. Every time we run out of uh, output buffer, we flush that to disk, free up that memory. Uh, every time we uh, finish the input buffer, we uh, read a new page in from disk, freeing the. Uh, I mean, there's nothing else in the input buffer. We don't need it anymore. So, and you might use more than one page for the input buffer and output buffer just for efficiency's sake, but uh, either way, you're not changing the amount of memory that you need. Right. Oh, no, 
still all in the same. Like you never had like you can't have four pages of the room like two pages of the alphabet like or is it all like um I mean you basically have uh, the the memory sizes that you'd pick are um, for the input and output buffers. However much memory you need, uh, so that you're never going to um, overflow or underflow the, the, the buffers. Uh, usually a couple of pages, just so that you can start fetching one page in um, and have it ready and in memory by the time that uh, that you're ready to read from it. Uh, same thing with the output buffer. You want to uh, keep it in memory just long enough so that you can safely flush it to disk. And the working set is as big as you can make it. I mean, it's the same thing with the, even with the unoptimized version. If you uh, load a bunch of data into memory, sort that, uh, the data that's in memory, and then flush it back to disk. The more memory you have to, to do that initial sort, the less, uh, the fewer iter total iterations of the al uh, algorithm you actually need. Uh, so in effect, this is basically doing the same thing, but by flushing one value into the output buffer at a time, you're, uh, as we'll see, you're effectively, well, actually, let's go through this analysis. Um, but either way, uh, at least you get some intuition that you're, you're getting more bang for your buck in terms of memory. Well, okay. Let's... Um, Let's actually try and quantify that. So let's say our working set size, is, let's uh, start this algorithm entirely from scratch and say that our working set size uh, is n pages. Or sorry, that our working set here is, is n pages. On data that comes in to the input buffer is going to be completely random, entirely uh, random. And just for uh, the sake of, of illustrations, uh, to make this concrete, let's say that the keys are between 1 and 1 million. So I read in a bunch, or okay, uh, let's make this even simpler, 1 and 100. So let's say I read in eight values. Uh, shout out to numbers. One. <laughs> Seventeen. Uh, Thirty-two. Fifty-five. Fifty-five. I'm going to need to shuffle these. Uh, let's say thirty-two, seventeen, uh, five, and uh, one and five. All right. Fifty-five. Okay. We got my data here. That's my working set. Well, actually, I do need to sort it now that I think about it. So the first step is to sort the working set. One, seventeen, thirty-two, fifty-five. And I got my working set. I take the first record, I dump it into my output buffer, and I freed up a, a slot in my working set. So I need to read a new value. It's my handy dandy random number generator here because. This, at this point, I actually do need a uh, uniform random uh, value. So, let's see where we are. Um, so my handy dandy random number generator here says 
47. So I need to put a 47 in here. I'm going to cheat and not actually move everything. Got some time operating on a blackboard. Um, and the next thing I need to move is 17. Now, even before I did that, what was the chance that after I put a 1 in here, there are two, basically two possible outcomes. Either I get something that is hookable, in other words, something that's bigger than 1, that's something that I'm going to be able to put into the current run. Or if I get a value that's less than 1, that's not going to be helpful for the current run. I'm not going to get anything less than 1, but eventually I'm going to get values that I can have uh, smaller values. So let's say I pick a random value in this list. Actually, let's make it a, uh, let's make it concrete. So for one, uh, if I put a one, uh, if I move the one to my output set, what is what's the probability that I'll get a value that's bigger than? Well, uh, yeah, bigger than or equal to one. So it's a hundred percent chance that the next value that I read is going to be useful. Um, there's a hundred percent chance that the next value I read is going to be useful. And what do you know? random chance paid off. 17, what's the chance that uh, the next value I draw will be useful? Okay, so uh, I have an 83% chance of drawing a completely random value that is bigger than 17. Um, okay, so as I'm, and what is my chance of uh, getting a value that isn't useful? Sixteen. So if I get anywhere between a one and a sixteen, that's going that's useless for the current run. I need that's basically me buffering for the next run. So. In general, we can throw a couple of, of uh, we can throw a couple of expectations here just to make our lives easier. Uh, in general, I'm going to start off at the top of this and I'm going to end up down here. So. Draw a little bit of a, a rough graph here. Um, so on my x-axis here, I'm going to do time, so basically the number of samples. On the y-axis, I'm going to keep track of the percent chance that uh, I'm going to get some useless data. So we started off with 1, and we got 1, and then we got uh, 6, that went up to 16, and uh, we might get a bunch of other samples here. Uh, so the next one would be 32. And, uh, and if you did this simulation a bunch of times, you essentially end up and fitted a uh, curve to it, you essentially get a linear, uh, the, the percent chance uh, is going to grow linearly with every single sample.
so we've got essentially uh, the chance that we read something that's useless is down here. The chance that we read something that is useful is up here. At the beginning uh, here, you're, you have a much, uh, as, as you're uh, closer to the top of your working set, um, you have a much larger chance of getting useful data. So every time you move down in your working set, uh, the chance of getting something useful goes down. And if you run a whole bunch of simulations and try this out uh, many, many times, uh, you'll essentially get uh, this kind of linear growth. So one way to think about this is that every time you take something out of your working set and put it into your output buffer, you've essentially virtually increased the size of your working set by one element. So this output run is going to consist of one extra element every time you're able to do this read, this reuse. So I have a nearly 100% chance of getting some reuse here. And by the time I get to the end, I have a nearly 0% chance of reuse. So on average, just completely on average, what for, for an, a, your, your typical average set in this replacement process, what's the chance that I will be able to virtually extend uh, the, the size of my working set by one element. Zero percent at the start, one hundred percent at the end. Sorry, one hundred percent at the start, zero percent at the end. Linear curve between fifty. So, so after I've gone through this entire working set once. I have virtually increased it by another 50%. Well, that's nice. Now, by the end of, uh, so I've, I've basically got a bunch more records that I can now go through and find the, the lowest one. So by the time I've, I've gone through these, so let's say this is n, this is n over 2, it's not in addition to uh, in addition to extending the size of my working set by by uh, fifty percent, I've also given myself n over two extra chances to uh, to extend it even further. So after I've gone through those n over two chances, how many more chances have I given? Myself? Probabilistically, given myself, uh, on average, uh, I, I've doubled the amount of memory that I have. I've doubled the size of uh, the sorted runs. So, this is kind of a useful trick. Um, and if I've doubled the size of my memory, I basically cut down on the number of iterations by one which is quite handy. So um, a external sort operator uh, really helps us out a lot, um, not just because it allows us to sort data, but it actually allows us to do some more uh, clever things uh, with other algorithms. So let me start off with one thing that I'm hoping at least someone will chime in with. Um, 
how could we use a out of core, uh, sorry, an external sort operator uh, to implement joins without using uh, ridiculous amounts of memory? Well, okay, so we, uh, we could in implement a, uh, a operator that, um, we could implement a external join using external, the external hash algorithm. Um, what, if we, what if we wanted to be lazy? Could we get away without implementing an external uh, join algorithm if we had a sort operator? Yeah? Exactly. Sort merge join requires absolutely uh, requires a constant amount of memory. Um, once the data is sorted, sort merge join runs uh, in in linear time. It gives you basically the best performance that you can get for any uh, for any equijoin algorithm. And uh, again, once the data is sorted, and uh, on top of that, it runs. Uh, it runs in a constant amount of memory. That's pretty much the best you can, uh, uh, one of the best things that you can do. Um, all right, so what about distinct? Let's say that I had an external sort operator. Now we mentioned distinct as having uh, memory requirements that were that grew with the amount of data that we had. How could we use a sort operator to implement distinct efficiently? Okay, so if we have a sorted list, we can iterate over the elements of the list and detect uh, when uh, we only need to use a constant amount of memory because, because of the fact that they're in sorted order, we're guaranteed that adjacent elements are going to, uh, excuse me, that all of the duplicate values are going to be adjacent in the list. So if I have a, a set of records um, and I'm able to sort them, then I can iterate over that list and every time I Again, yeah, so all of the dupli duplicates are guaranteed to be adjacent. So if I run into a duplicate value, um, I can detect it without actually having to, to keep more than one uh, more than one uh, piece of history. Questions so far? All right. Um, okay. So if I can do distinct, how would I do? Uh, how would I do group by? So if my data is already sorted, with distinct, I was guaranteed that duplicates uh, records would always be adjacent. What if I just sorted by the group by attributes? And I'm guaranteed that ev uh, any two records that have the same group by attributes are going to be adjacent in the list. And again, as I'm iterating through the list, I only have to keep track of the most recent group. So same, similar example. Uh, I take list, I sort it, um, and then as I iterate over the elements of the list, I can, uh, when I hit 1-1, one, one, um, I can initialize my uh, iterator, and if I'm trying to compute, let's say, a sum uh, of the second attribute, I compute, I start with 1-1, one, one, um, I start my iterator off with um,
one. So I set up a group for uh, one. And I set up a group for one and start that iterator off at one. Um, then I read one five and I can update that iterator. Then I read the next record to two. And at this point, I know that I'm never, ever, 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 ever going to see another one because otherwise the list wouldn't be sorted. So I just keep going through this process, emitting uh, a two to the second group when I get to the, the three. And I never need to keep more than a constant amount of uh, state. I, once, once I get this two, I can forget, I can output that and just forget about it entirely. All right, any questions so far? So let me rephrase that. Um, any questions on how you, oh, well, let me ask you a question. How would you take this sort by operator and we kind of, uh, I'm, I'm operating, I, when I described it, I was operating at a fairly high level of abstraction. What would you actually need in order to implement it? So let's break it down step by step. The first step, read in a bunch of uh, data and sort it. What's, what's involved in that process? Uh, for, ex uh, for external merge, merge sort, yeah. Um, let me actually go to the appropriate slide. Um, for the first, uh, the first step, read in a bunch of records and write it out. Uh, what? Even just, uh, how would you go about that? The that first step, reading in a bunch of records. What, what do you need to, to have for that? Okay, so you could use something like buffered reader, but let's go even in uh, even a little bit uh, deeper than that. What? So um, I need to, uh, before I can write anything out to disk, I actually need to settle on some <coughs> representation, some uh, data representation that it's going to be in. Now, initially, your data is all in uh, in uh, essentially CSV format. What other uh, what are uh, what decisions would you? Uh, what is the decision process for for deciding uh, what kind of format would be appropriate? What, what are the options? Let me uh, put it that way. Okay, so we could, um, so there's a couple of different ways that we could uh, store the columns, or we could split the columns across. Um, what about, uh, 
So we, we talked about a couple of different ways of storing uh, uh, of storing records. What were how, how do you store, let's say, just a record? What CSV is, is one of those ways. What else could you use to store one record? One line of this. Okay, so some sort of array. What what does the array give us? It gives gives you the values for every each column of the index. So by storing some uh, something in a, an array, you know where everything is, so you don't need to access all of the fields. Is that a concern here? So yeah, if, um, it's potentially a concern. If you have 50 fields, you're only trying to sort on one of them. You only need to parse one of those fields. So potentially storing it in some sort of array representation might be useful. Um, what are some drawbacks? What are the typical drawbacks of storing things in an array? Not that, uh, say that again? It's not dynamic. Uh, so I can't change the size of the array. I actually need to know the schema of, of every uh, element. I do actually know the schema in this case, so maybe that's OK. What are some other advantages or disadvantages? Yeah? I mean, as far as storing goes, you need to better, you mentioned Oh, sorry. That's uh, I uh, dyna yeah, right. The dynamic the record sizes themselves are uh, also potentially dynamic, and you don't necessarily know how big the the uh, record sizes are going to be. So yes, you're right. Um, uh, if I'm dealing with strings, maybe I don't actually uh, have enough information to uh, put everything into an array format. Um, one other uh, one other kind of side effect of that is that you don't necessarily you need to keep track of where the sorted chunks are. Where does one sorted chunk end, and where does the other one begin? And if you know that you have a fixed number of records, you can keep it all in the same place. Um, Okay, so you pick a, a, a format. Um, uh, CSV might be uh, easier to implement. That might be another factor in its uh, uh, in, uh, pushing for it. Um, it's not necessarily uh, well, there's uh, there are a couple of different options. So once we read uh, read everything in, we sort it, uh, we write it back. What about phase two? So what challenges might you face while implementing phase two? merge in the first place. Um, keeping track of what buffers you still have, uh, what work you still need to do in order to merge data together. Um, and this ties into the, the thing I just said uh, before. Where what parts of the data are sorted, and 
where are uh, where do they live? How how much you how might you decide on how to organize the, the different sorted runs? What what are possible ways that you could implement? So each of the, the pages that you're reading have to be stored somewhere, right? How do you decide what constitutes one page or one uh, sorted run? OK, so if I know that uh, my data is stored in many separate ways, great. I can, I can figure out what good partition points are. Uh, so maybe I, I, I keep track of the fact that um, uh, I'm going to create sorted runs initially of, of size 1,000. So after I, I finish sorting the full uh, uh, sorting chunks of, of size 1,000, I know that the first 1,000 records are already sorted. The next 1,000 records are sorted. Then I can start merging uh, there. Any other possibilities? Another possibility is to let the file system uh, handle this for you. Create one file for each sorted run. I'm going to create a huge number of files, but maybe that's OK. OK, uh, so in the last five minutes or so, um, are there any questions about stuff we've covered today, or are there any final questions about uh, the project? All right. Well, um, like I said, I'll be posting extended office hours on um, Piazza uh, tonight. They'll, there will be office hours tomorrow and maybe on Monday. Good luck on the project.